young entrepreneurs. So um, I'm just going to ask now, do you want me to use a microphone or should I just scream because I have a loud voice in there? Should I just scream? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just scream, okay? Right, okay. So firstly, I'd like to thank Gempi for organizing tonight, as well as uh, Michael Goldberg and the US Embassy. Um, I think it's very important because the US still is the mecca for entrepreneurship and innovation and technology. And there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from the States. All of their successes, all of their failures will contribute to what our successes and our failures are. But it is our job and our responsibility to not only learn from them, but stand on their shoulders so we can actually go further together, our economies go together. So I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I know that uh, Michael, Michael's an academic, so he was going to give you a more, like, a more academic and a practitioner's and an intelligent sort of view on, uh, on, on, on investment. But what I'm going to do is more of a, I want to give you guys a how-to tonight. Right? I come to get me quite, quite a bit, but tonight I wanted to give you all a how-to. Because I actually, I know that many of you are first-time entrepreneurs, are just starting off, and some of you are, are you know, obviously on your way towards funding, but I wanted to give you more of a how-to. But before I do so, I'll just give a quick introduction of, my, of myself for those who don't know me. I was born uh, on the island next to Java, which is Sumatra, just in a little village called Parambanjang. But when I was a kid, when I was about three or, or so years old, I moved over to Sydney, Australia, where I grew up, and I just saw a dear friend, a childhood friend of mine from Sydney also. Her name is Sari, who uh, works in media and all that sort of stuff. Um, but he's now going to be an awesome social entrepreneur. So when I was a kid, I, I lived in Sydney, and that's where I continued and completed all of my, um, my education until I graduated with my master's. And then um, thereafter, do we have a clicker? Do I have a clicker? Yeah, next one. Right. And then thereafter, I worked in Singapore for about five years for American Express. I worked within the uh, in, in the brand advertising and just uh, the, the product marketing area, um, where I helped American Express launch a range of different products all around um, in Singapore and around the Asia Pacific. And then after that, I moved over to Hong Kong, where I continued to support American Express as well as um, even Citibank at that stage, as well as Samsung, LG, and a range of different uh, brands all around the world. And then thereafter, I moved over after Hong Kong. I moved over to um, yeah, I moved over to London, and that's where I helped uh, supported Microsoft and a range of other brands, also such as British Telecom, which is BT, um, BP, etc. And then from there, I moved over to San Francisco, um, and I lived just at. Um, at a place called Potrero Valley, and I work with a range of different clients in Silicon Valley as well as um, in the city there. But then thereafter, um, I, I moved over to, um, to uh, Jakarta, and this is what Michael and everybody and all of us, yes, that's what we all experience today. And this is what I'm going to talk to you now firstly about, is that your job as entrepreneurs are to solve aspirin problems. If you truly want to change the world, if you truly want to become a great entrepreneur, move into an aspirin industry. And what I mean by that is that there are problems which are aspirin, which give us headaches on a daily basis, right? Such as traffic, such as pollution, such as crime. These are the solutions that need to be delivered on a daily basis and very urgently. These are aspirin problems. The next type of problems are vitamin problems. And vitamin are more sort of cosmetic stuff, more fashion and beauty and you know things that make the world more beautiful, but do not significantly alter the course of the world's future. And I believe that in this small room of pioneers, that I hope that we all are going to try and move more towards aspirin industries rather than vitamin ones. Right? And just when Michael talked about investing in Israel, right? Israel is a major, huge template for innovation. Okay? Now, there is a gent by the name of Yossi Vardi, okay? and I have been invited many on many occasions to go to Israel to mentor, to teach, to help, and to be part of the ecosystem there. 
And it is a nation that has almost no natural resources, but the greatest single, the single greatest resource, which is people, which is the human mind, right? And you can learn from a nation such as Israel. You can learn from a nation such as Singapore that literally has nothing, right? Indonesia, we have oil, forestry, we have fish, we have everything. You throw a seed, Right? You, you throw seed on Indonesian soil and something will grow out of that. This is Indonesia. Singapore has nothing, but they are the world's now top number one most expensive nation. Right? And the world's most expensive nation slash city state. Right? And even different metrics all the time, but it kind of like oscillates between Singapore as well as uh, Zurich or London or, 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 or UK, wherever. But generally it's up there. Its GDP, Singapore's GDP, has bolstered from US $3,000 50 years ago to US $83,000 today. A huge increase in, US, in GDP per capita. What do we have to show for ourselves? Right? And this is why we've invited Michael to come here today, and this is why we partner, and this is why Kepi was established also to ensure that we are ahead of the curve, that we are no longer behind the curve, that we are not on the curve, but we are ahead of the curve and on the crest of innovation and on the crest of global change. So I also, just, just as a side note also, I am a part of the Think School of Creative Leadership in Amsterdam. So I fly back and forth between Jakarta through to London and to Amsterdam and I work with a range of different amazing people all around the world. Right? From royalty through to CEOs through to leaders and we go there and we work on ways to change the world. Everything from Internet of Things through to, um, through to smart cities and smart nations. All these different ways um, that we can improve the world. Right, the first thing that I really want to do today is break some myths about venture capital and investment. Okay? There is this myth that all venture capitalists are tremendously wealthy, right? That they ride around in the most expensive Rolls Royces and Mercedes Benz, etc. And everybody in the venture capital industry is extraordinarily wealthy and powerful. Myth. Okay? They are not. Many of them. Most in Indonesia are actually struggling. Many from Indonesia are actually, this is their first job that they've leapt into the industry of investment or venture capital. They sometimes only earn about 5 million per month or 6 million or 8 million per month, right? Or 10 million, 20 million rupees per month, right? So they're not earning a lot of money, many of them. They work for funds and, um, and, and limited partners, etc. So do not meet a venture capitalist and assume that they are David Sorry, I assume that they are Goliath and you are David. So the first thing I want to teach you is that when you meet a venture capitalist, you are on equal footing. Do not assume the position of victim. Do not even assume the position of victor. Assume the position of equal partner with a venture capitalist or somebody who works within the area of VC or angel investment. Right? Also, there is another myth that the VC world, the venture capital world, has so tremendously profited from innovation and from all these great successes. That's not true. VC has not even bro broken even yet. The world of VC has not even broken even yet. Right? So there are so many investments out there that you hear, like the apples of the world that Michael was mentioning. All these other big companies, yeah. For some of those VCs, they've made a huge ton of money. But every single day, right, there is some new VC popping up and another VC that's collapsing and that's died. It's not an industry that has broken even yet. It is your job to help that VC break even and not break even but actually profit. Okay? Next one. Right. When you meet a VC, and Michael asks you all a very important question, who's doing this full time, right? How many of you raise your hands? 
I didn't see many. Now that is the first cause for concern when you talk to an investor. When you talk to an investor and they get even an inkling from you, right, that you are doing this part time, that this is your nice to have job on the side, you are not interesting and you are certainly not investable. There is a huge gap between building a startup that is interesting versus a startup that is investable. When you are interesting, you're okay, you're quirky, you're fun, but when you are investable, you are going to change the world, I believe, or we believe, you're going to change the world, you're going to make a huge impact, and I'm going to be part of that awesome journey with you towards awesomeness, and we're all going to walk away as millionaires or billionaires or whatever. That's when you are investable. Huge gap between interesting to investable. Your job is to make sure that you are investable. Right? So we need to know, as Michael asks you, are you in or are you out? So the next time Michael comes here or any venture capitalist that you meet asks you, are you in, are you part-time in what? Well, you simply raise your hand and you say, I am in. I am in this. And this is a problem for Indonesians. We are the worst people in the world when it comes to this. We do not know how to say no to something that does not mesh or align to our dreams and goals. We say yes to everything. That's true, right? Your friend has a business, it's a restaurant. Do you want to join in? Yeah, I'll join in your restaurant business. And then another friend wants to open up a clothes company, or you have an open clothes company business that you want to open. So you do that also. And on the side, you're also doing something else, and you're also doing something else, and you're also doing something else. I've got news for you. If you have more than one business interest right now, or one more than one particular job, whatever, you will absolutely fail. You will not achieve the potential. You are either in or you are out. I see a number of women here, right? Can you, can, let me ask the woman, can you be half pregnant? <laughs> Is it possible to be half pregnant? No. I'm, I, I'm half pregnant. No, you're either pregnant or you're not. And that's the thing about being all in. It firstly gives the investor confidence that you are going to use her or his money wisely to advance and accelerate. Right? So, no more, because if you are working 5% there, 10% there, 20% there, whatever, that's the maximum potential that you will achieve. I will ask you a question now about focus. What do you know Mark Zuckerberg for? What do you know Bill Gates for? That's it. If you want to leave a legacy in this world, leave just one legacy in this world. What do you know Steve Jobs for? What do you know Steve Bosniak for? Pick one, do it. Go for it, 100% all in. Okay? You got my first point? Second point, sorry. The next thing that I wanted to share with you is your idea. As I was saying, your idea needs not to be interesting, but must be investable. Right? There must be some logic to your idea. It must be visionary. And when I say visionary, it's not, you're not working on um, a project that within five years or so is going to be redundant. Right? It's trying to sell cassettes in an era that's gone to CDs. You love it, you like it, it's memorabilia, it's great to have records and cassettes, but I'm sorry, it's not going to make you rich. You might stand up for the I love the record and the blackness, but it's not going to make anybody rich. Right? So you have to be visionary, you have to have foresight. Right? And your idea must stand that test of time. Right? You will have competitors that come in to want to compete with you, right? But 
your idea must have the legs and it must have the blood and it must have the muscle to always constantly evolve. Right? You have to ensure that you are constantly innovating. Because if you are, are as they say, right? Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So when you create a product or a service or a platform that somebody wants to imitate, right? That's flattery, but that's also a threat. That could potentially kill you. Right? So you've got to constantly be on the curve of innovation. The fashion industry innovates five years or four years beforehand. You are wearing today what somebody thought and envisioned and dreamt you'd be wearing four or five years ago. That's how far ahead the fashion industry is working out right now. They're already starting to work on which materials, what colors. Are you going to be wearing skinny jeans? Are you going to be wearing what sort of stuff in the year 2020, 2021? That's the fashion industry. Where are you with your innovation curve? Have you got an innovation pipeline? That makes you investable. That makes you, that makes an investor know and believe that you have foresight. Right. Dear friend, William Tanuvijaya. You all admire him, I assume, right? Great guy. He started from zero and now he's built Tokopedia. Right, which is Indonesia's Alibaba platform. Right? What you now need to convince to the VC or the investor is that you are the next one. You are the next William Tanuvijaya. Or you are the next, who's your hero? Right? Who is your startup hero? You are that next hero. And in fact, you will be greater than them. For many of you, and unfortunately I will say this about women, right? Because they're absolutely it's shocking to me that ever since I was in this country that women feel the need that they have to sort of cripple up and sort of, you know, sort of, you know, ask permission to be great or ask permission if they can just listen to me. Women, you do not need permission to be great. You might be in what is a predominantly male industry, right? But you have the absolute brains to conquer all of us. Right? You have the brains, and in fact, you contribute to 50% of this country's problems. So we expect you to contribute to 50% of this country's solutions. Right? True, right? Okay? So here's the thing also, is that whether you are a man, whether you're a woman, you've got to stand up and say, you know what? I'm going to be the next greatest entrepreneur, and do not be shy about saying that. That leaves a strong impression, because here's the thing is that the idea that I spoke to you about beforehand, it will change, it will pivot. And I will, and any other VC or investor, will do everything that we can to bomb your ideas. Right? Because there you are, building bridges, right? You're constantly building bridges to investors and VCs and saying, you know what, here is what I'm doing and this is what I'm trying to do, right? But as you're building bridges, that investor and people around you will be building bombs to bomb your idea. Now you have to ensure that your bridges withstand bombs, withstand people attacking them. But, and the only way that your bridge can withstand any bombs is through innovation, constantly evolving. Right? So you have to show your leadership capabilities, and that is everything from attitudinal through to action-based steps that you are taking. Right, the next thing, as Michael told you also, when he invests, it's all about the team. I cannot emphasize this more. If you are here as a solo entrepreneur, you are not even interesting to any of us. Nobody wants to invest in you. You are high risk and you shouldn't even be in this forum right now. You are only investable when you have a solid team. Not when you have a team, but when you have a solid team. Right? Because if you are alone, you are high risk. When you are a team, we can trust a range of different people. You know? When one decides to quit, the other four could potentially move forward. 
And this is what you've got to do. You've got to be able to sell your team better than anybody else. Right? If you believe that you are super intelligent, you've got to ensure that your team is even more super intelligent than you. And you must build an A team. And what I mean by building an A team is that A players, which are, I assume, all of you here, right? Because you're like ambitious, you're go getters, you're pioneers, you're creative, you are A players, right? A players only enjoy playing with A players or working with A players. Right? A players do not like working with B players. Why? Because B players are slow, they don't understand, they don't get it, they need permission, they don't know what to do. They are B players. Now, when you get a B player to work with you, B players actually really get really scared of working with A players. They get quite nervous, or they get intimidated, or they don't perform properly. And the only worst thing about B players working is a, with A players is that they don't work well with B players. Because then they get into competition mode with B players. And then what happens is that these B players end up hiring C players. And these C players then start hiring D players. And there goes the destruction of your company. <laughs> so, if you are a leader, not only will you boast about yourself, but you will boast about your team and express to the VC and investor that your team is actually smarter than you. That you are a giant, but they stand above you and they and together you all see a lot further. Right? Next thing also is that you want investment money. You are not credible. This is your first startup you have a 95% likelihood of failing. You are not investable. Point blank. Especially in an economy like Indonesia. Not investable at all. Now, how do you increase your credibility? You increase your credibility by saying, yes, I am a rookie. Yes, this is my first startup. But I have an extraordinary team of advisors. And these are people who are awesome when it comes to finance, when it comes to technology, when it comes to experience-based, when it comes to auto, you know, automate everything. What, what do we all need advisory on? on? On general management, on technology, on business, on everything. Right? These are people who may have served as C-level executives in particular companies. These are people that you admire and respect. And these are people that a lot of people, most people admire and respect. Get those people. Build an advisory team. Yes, you will have to give them some equity, but it's better to give them equity than to you to not have anything and not be investable. So find the entrepreneurs and the CEOs that you love and admire and respect and say, please beg them, come on my advisory board. Because imagine, imagine if you met an investor and then you said to that investor, yeah, this is me, this is my first startup, this is my idea, this is my goal, this is my tremendous team, but hey, look at my advisory board. I've got the professor of this advising us on that. I've got Michael here doing, I've got, every, I've, I've got all these amazing and tremendous people supporting me. You are suddenly investable. So think about that. Network and get there. Get to the most important people in the entrepreneurial and the business ecosystem. And get them to advise you. And not only is it a title for them to advise you, but it is their responsibility to advise and mentor you. Yeah? Now, here's the thing. is that Let's sort this out. I know Michael asked you guys before, asked everybody before, well, what are the other reasons why venture capitalists, uh, you know, invest in you, right? Because of the future of, of you know, of, of, you, know they, it, you know, you're aligned to their philosophies, etc., right? Okay, let's get this straight, right? There are no Mother Teresa's probably here, right? She's an extraordinary woman, right? She's had, had an extraordinary legacy. There are probably no Mother Teresa's here. Yes, I know some of you want to solve the problems of poverty, social, all these issues. But here's the point where I tell you now, right? Do not be 
right? A dog, do not be a wolf dressed as a cat, right? You are what you are. Do not present yourself as a social entrepreneurial pursuit if you are a for-profit pursuit. Right? A lot of entrepreneurs, they position themselves as being for the base of the pyramid, for people who are at the bottom, like for, for people in poverty or people wherever, right? If that's not your part of your mission, if that's not part of your goal, then don't dress yourself as that. Right? And certainly, that there, there, we are, there are particular impact investors that are interested in investing in social entrepreneurs, right? But then there are, you know, for profit or venture capitalists that have no interest in supporting, you know? If you solve a huge problem, that's a big enough change in the world that they don't need to see that you're supporting the base of the pyramid. But you've got to pick your stance. Which is it? Are you a social entrepreneur or are you an entrepreneur? Be clear and be firm with that from the start. Oftentimes, I've got particular companies that started off as social, as started off as social entrepreneurs, but then they evolved into for profit. But be clear and be firm from the start. What are you? Right? And also, the next thing is that you need to understand that it is ultimately about the return on investment. Right? Somebody is giving you money. If you gave somebody money, do you want it back minimally? Yes, you do. Right? Now, if you were a venture capitalist, you want your money back plus multiples of that. Right? So ultimately, when you sell to venture capitalists, it is about the money. You've got to make it sexy enough for them to understand that for you, yeah, and this is very, very important. When you pitch to entrepreneurs, right, don't give them a 100% TED pitch. This is not a TED talk, right? It could be 20% inspiring, but then it's got to be 80% sales and return on investments for them. Right? We understand you love Ted, right? But they want their money back and more. Right? So the ultimate language is the language of money. No, your numbers. The next thing also is chemistry. You've got to ensure that you have chemistry with the people. Do not just go with any investors that, that are out there. You've got to build that connection and ensure that there's chem good chemistry between yourself and your team and that that venture capitalist is going to add to the chemistry of what you're building together. There is no point force fitting a relationship. It kind of feels right from the start or it doesn't feel right from the start. It's like a marriage, isn't it? If you force it, it's like unlikely going to work. Right? But if it just kind of feels right, kind of feels natural, it should work. Right? So ensure that there is good chemistry. Because a lot of what happens within the world of venture capital doesn't always relate to numbers, but it also relates to how they feel that they can trust and how their chemistry is with you too. Right. This is an important point also. This is a movie script. Okay? This is a movie script. Importantly, as entrepreneurs, what I want you to do is flip the script. Okay? The script tells you that this is the plot, this is the story, and this is the hierarchy of everything. I want you all to flip the script, right? And when you speak to entrepreneurs, right, as I was saying before, do not assume the position of a beggar, right? Do not be that particular character. Be on equal par with them and flip the script in that sort of way, right? You create your journey as an entrepreneur and they are a part of that journey right do not they are not the be all and end all of your startup just because you you have a startup and you don't get investment that doesn't mean that that's the end of your story or your movie or whatever or that particular one your movie and your chapters will go on but it's up to you to narrate that and to flip the script at any time that you feel that you don't have the power in the equation right Next thing also, very important, before you speak to any, uh, any investors, sort out your social media, please. <laughs> right? How many times have I spoken to entrepreneurs or people or whatever, and then due diligence and all these different things are happening, and all of a sudden you check out their social media, and they're saying a really horrible thing about somebody. 
or they're swearing, right? Or they are, they, they look like they, they, they're just, like some of the tweets that I read are like, okay, completely will never invest in that human being. <laughs> right? So here's the thing, sort out your social media. Right? Nobody cares what you ate for lunch yesterday. I promise you, nobody cares. <laughs> Not even your great, great, great grandchildren. Nobody cares. If you want to become entrepreneurs, sort out what is your area of expertise, what is your area of passion, and tweet about that. Be the expert when it comes to the environment. Be the expert when it comes to traffic. Be the expert when it comes to fashion. Whatever you want to become, be the expert at that. Sort out your social media. Nobody cares if you're having a fight or an argument with a particular person. If you're going to make that public, right, you're going to make the, your issues with that venture capitalist or whoever public also. Clean your social media, people, because it is your mirror to the world. And you create your social media. Next thing also is that start early. You can never be early when it comes to mingling and talking and, 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 and starting to try to raise funds. You do not want to raise funds at the 11th hour, at 11.59 when you can't pay people's salaries or when you have some sort of debt or rent or whatever to pay, right? Start early and start talking to people and start seeing in that you need money and this is the particular level of investment that you need. The more people that, the more relevant people that you communicate that to, the faster you can get seeded or funded. Start early. Early is never early enough. Next thing also, and I've only got a few more to go, right? Is do your research. Right? Do your research. Do not go out there and start calling everybody and start, no, do your research first. Understand, what truly is your startup? Who truly are your competitors? What truly is your unique selling proposition? What truly, what true value are you bringing to the world? If you tell me now, if I'm a VC, right, and if I ask you now, who are your competitors? And you come up to me and you say, well, I have no competitors because I am this great genius and I have this great idea and da 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 da. Number one, it's unlikely that I believe you. And then number two, you'll be proven wrong at some sort of stage. Either when I talk to you thereafter, or some sort of stage when I research later. Right? And then you become high risk because it means that your startup is not validated. Nobody wants to get into your area. Right? So do your research. Understand what is your industry? What are you doing now? Right? And this is something that Indonesians don't do. Because here's a problem that we have as Indonesians. When you and I have a business idea, the first thing that, is, that we do is that we talk about it, we say yes to the business idea, and then all of a sudden, we've got a logo. And then all of a sudden, we've got a website. That's the Indonesian failure story. Because that's how it's all done. But you haven't built the bones of that. You haven't built the DNA of that company. You haven't built that startup. Right? You have not gone through the sensing process, the harvesting process, the visioning process, the prototyping process. You've gone from idea to logo to website. How come we've got no customers? Next thing also, networking is very, very vital. If you're an introvert or if you're an extrovert, you've got to get out there. Get out there and network. Right? Investment is a people business. Right? At some sort of stage, I'm, I'm sure that the world of investments will become automated somehow. Right? Technology will deem us redundant. Right? But here's the thing, is that investment today is a people business. You've got to have strong EQ. Everybody talks about having a great idea, having great numbers, but if you do not have EQ as an entrepreneur, which is emotional intelligence, you're not going to survive or thrive in the world of business. You see somebody like Richard Branson, okay? He was dyslexic. He didn't go to university. He didn't like there was, he, had, he had a lot of issues just with academia. But he's got great EQ. He knows how to deal with people. He knows how to talk. He knows how to inspire. If you don't have EQ, if you don't know how to network, if you don't like networking, you shouldn't be here. Get out there, talk to people, learn how to talk to people. Also, cast a net out wide. 
right? When you want money or you want investment, start to research. Understand the universe of investment. Who invested in Tokopedia? Who invested in Bukalapa? Who invested in um, God, who invested in all of these different companies, whether they're at whatever stage right now, understand. Cast your net out wide. Don't be so narrow in your search. Find out who done this. Don't only search for local investors in Jakarta or Bandung or whatever. Search across ASEAN. Understand that there are incubators that are happening in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Turkey, in the Philippines, whatever. You are an entrepreneur. You are here to solve global problems. Right? And there could be global investors out there. So cast your net out wide. But then, after you cast your net out wide, how many more minutes to have? Are you guys okay learning tonight? Yes. Yeah? Okay. After you cast your net out wide, then you zoom in. Yeah? Yeah? Then after that, you zoom in. Right? And when you zoom in, then you start to focus. If you have an IoT, which is an Internet of Things company, you then focus on those sorts of investors. If you have a company, if you have um, investors that are interested in virtual reality, then you focus on them. If you have investors that have a particular philosophy about e-commerce, then you start to focus on them. Right? So after casting your net out wide, then you start to focus. Right? On who are your most likely investors. Right? Also, Understand the language. Learn the lingo. <coughs> what does it mean? What does angel investment mean? What does series A, series B mean? What's a convertible note? What is IPO? What is all the what are all these things? Learn the lingo. Right? Understand the language. In the way that we understand Bahasa Indonesia, right, or English, investment has its own language. In the same way that physics and chemistry have their own languages also. So understand the language, read books, talk to mentors, talk to people, so you understand the language. Because when you understand the language, then you can communicate properly. And you are not the victim at the end of the game. Right, know your numbers. Vital, know your numbers. Have a chief finance officer. Right? If you do not know your numbers, what are you going to produce? Right? We all have skills and talents. Right? Some of us are great at Excel spreadsheets. Some of us, like me, are not great at Excel spreadsheets. Know which one you are. Right? Are you right brain? Are you creative? Know your Myers books. Know all these things. All of your strengths. And build on them. So, what you focus on are your strengths. What you allow others to focus on are their strengths. Do not get a weak numbers person to start churning out numbers and forcing them. No. Numbers come naturally to certain people, they don't to others. Especially at our age. I include myself at your age. Right? Alright, all those final few. Right? The next thing also, just there, is the point about building. Right? Relationships do not just arrive there. Do not, when you meet an investor, don't stand in front of their face and sell to them. That's not your goal, to stand in front of their face and sell to them on the first time you meet them. Build a relationship with them. How would you like it if you walk down the mall right now, right, and then somebody in front of your face tried to sell to you, right? Tried to sell, you know, like pamphlets and, you know, those people that come up, to those sales promotion people? That's how it feels to be an investor, right? When you know you walk into a mall and somebody's like in your face sort of stuff, right? Don't do that. Just on your first exchanges, build a relationship. And here's a great thing, right? If you want to be loved or respected or admired or liked, what you must learn to do is listen. So why don't you, when you meet an investor, instead of you robbing that whole time and just trying to sell them something that they're going to forget about, why don't you listen to them? Hey, investor. What was your most recent investment? Tell me about it. I'd love to learn about it. They'll tell you. And they'll remember you as the person who listened and learned at the first day. Not somebody who was in their face trying to sell something to them. Right? Also, this one here is about cold calling. Do not cold call. Your first option is to get networked in. If you want to meet an investor, right? 
understand, right? Look at your network, whether it's via LinkedIn or via Twitter or via Facebook or whatever, and try to be one degree away from that particular investor or person. Because investment is centered on trust. If I trust you now, which I do, right? And you referred me to one of your friends, right? And you said, Udawempi, I've got this great friend of mine who's working on this particular platform. I would listen to you and, and invest in your friend rather than somebody over there trying to talk to me now and say, well, I don't know you and who are you? Okay? So study your network and not only study your network but build your network so you are one degree or first degree away from that person. Right? I'm going to go quick for the next ones. Learn how to pitch. You must learn how to pitch. Come out there and state what is your extraordinary statement. Why should people invest in Why should that particular person invest in you? And know how to pitch. Right? And when you pitch, you've got to be able to sell. Sell your story. Sell your vision. Sell your product and ideas. Sell your sell the future. And here's the thing. Pitching, right, is not about pitching. There is a thing called storytelling. And storytelling is a craft that all entrepreneurs must learn. It's the art of telling a story. Well, I don't believe in storytelling. I go one above that, right? And on top of storytelling, right, is story building, right? Where you have a story and that story evolves and becomes higher until it reaches a particular climax or pinnacle. And actually, I don't even believe in the fundamental greatness of story building. I believe in the importance of story selling. So every part of your story, every sentence, you are selling. You are selling yourself. You are selling your team. You are selling your vision. You are selling your idea. You are selling the value. Sell, sell, sell. If you are not selling with every single sentence, you are a ship that's passing at night. You will not be seen, you will not be heard. Next one. Right? And also, I wanted to um, just mark on a point which is about competition. This is very important. I believe in the importance of competitions. Because I believe that's when we become greater and better as human beings. I believe even more so than competition, I believe in co-opetition, which is cooperation plus competition. We cooperate and partner with people, but we also compete to become better. But when we talk about competitions, I want you all to be active in startup competitions. Get out there, gain confidence, put yourself out there, take a risk of making a fool out of yourself. Because I've sure done that a number of times and it's been captured and it's on YouTube or whatever. <laughs> right? It's fantastic to have people hate on you. It's great. Right? So here's the thing. Don't be afraid of making a fool of yourself and learning and growing and becoming better. Because you will have the last laugh. You will have the last laugh. So be brave and join those competitions. Because then thereafter, when you win local competitions, you can win national competitions. You can win international, regional and international competitions that could potentially get you investment. I am a judge. I get invited to, to judge most of the competitions here in Indonesia as well as overseas. I judge competitions here in Indonesia, obviously, in Singapore, in Switzerland, in Africa, in South America, in America. And I travel to all of these different countries to judge a lot of the entrepreneurship competitions. And I see greatness at that particular level. And it will push you towards greatness. Right? However, I wanted to put also a caveat on that. Do not be a competition monkey. Right? In a way that you're out there, you don't know your stuff, but you're just constantly out there. It's like what we call those PR monkeys. Those startups that all that they want to do is just become famous. And there's a lot of those startups that the CEO, the only thing that they want to do is be mentioned by Tech in Asia. 
or Daily Social or whatever. That's their big badge to the world. And I will tell you now, be very, very careful. Because if you go out there and you start talking to media about how great you are, say you've got a startup, right? It's called, um, it's called, uh, Scaram. As in, like, you can fix everything up, Scaram, right? Whatever. Scaram.com, whatever, right? And then you go out there in media and you're, like, boasting about how great you are and how Scaram now has got all this, you know, traction, da 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 da, and that you're an unstoppable, you know, entrepreneur. That's 2015, 16, sorry. And then, in three years' time, you're Googleable. And your startup has completely tapped and failed. So here's the thing. I want you all to focus on your product before you focus on your PR. And this is a mistake that egotistical Indonesians constantly, constantly make. We're searching for PR, we're searching to be famous, and we don't focus on the product. Develop an awesome product before you start talking to the media, because you are going to look like an idiot in a few years' time. Not because you fail, right, because failure is a part of the process, is an outcome of the process, right, but because you believed in your own PR, and you spun your own PR. And you were the cause of that because you were so focused on PR that your product tanked. And then my final point, right, is just remember that when you are, as I was saying, I will really up on this one, when you are meeting with VCs or, or, um, or investors, that you are on an even deal. You are a negotiator. You must learn how to negotiate. It's one of the most important human skills one of the most important entrepreneurial skills and one of the most important life skills that you can actually ever learn. Right? Learn how to negotiate. It can be learned. Negotiation is not only through, um, through like numbers and through logics and through rationale, but it is through emotion also. It is through how you sell the story. Right? It is also um, when it comes to negotiation, body language also plays an important part of that. And if you, if investors see that you have a high propensity to always say yes, 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 yes to them all the time, they will think that you are a pusher. <coughs> so when an investor sends you a contract, don't just blindly say yes to everything. Have a look at that. Push back on certain things. Have insight, have input, and want to negotiate. Right? Is there, do I have a final pinch check? Just the last one. And just, yeah, actually, the final point is that it is a bumpy road for all of us. Not just for you, but for me and for, my, for all of us. Whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a VC, it is a road that goes up and down. Be prepared for that journey. Right? Because actually my final slide is that this is what I want you to become, a cockroach. Okay? I want you to all become a cockroach. Because a cockroach is the only animal, right? A dinosaur is huge, right? Dinosaurs are huge. All these animals are huge. But this cockroach, the cockroach, has survived through bombs, has survived through um, disasters, has survived through everything. The cockroach. You might dislike them, you might feel a bit jittery looking at that particular photo, but you should learn from that and actually be able to become one. Cool? Alright, did you learn a lot? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
so they, uh, they can join us to be our mentor? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really great and very, very important question to, to ask. That's a great first question. Thank you. What was your name? Uh, William from Del Mare. Okay, thank you, William. Thank you. Great question. Okay. Firstly, mentorship. There is nothing, almost nothing greater or more important than I believe in for your success than mentorship. Let's talk about the world's greatest football players, or soccer as Americans call them. <laughs> soccer. Don't get that, but yes, it's called soccer, right? It's called football, okay? Now, right, we have Lionel Messi, we have Ronaldo, we have David Beckham. They became great at the age of, in their teens and in their 20s and in their 30s, because they had mentors and coaches from a very, very young age. From when they were two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old, they had mentors. Other than their parents, they had their mentors and their coaches. How many of you now, at the age of 20 or 25, 30, 35, can actually say that you have a true and honest mentor? How many of you can say that? That's poor. That's terrible. And this is probably a strong reason why we don't have any Mark Zuckerbergs in this room. You need a mentor. If it worked for Ronaldo and Messi and all these athletes that peak when they're 18 or 20 or 22, you're going to need it now. How do you convince a person to become your mentor? Firstly, find people, a person that you admire, that is reputed, that is credible, and approach them and say, Baba, I would love for you to become my mentor. Because these are the reasons why. I have studied your career, I have studied your history, I have come to watch you do this, do that, whatever, and I would love for you to be my mentor. And this is what I'm building. Build a contract with a mentor. Mentoring should not be an informal process. It should not be something that just happens whenever you feel like it. Make it happen on a monthly basis or on a three month sort of basis. If you have a startup, tell your mentor, right, if they're busy, hey mentor, I want you to become an advisor in my startup and I will give you equity in my company. I will give you how much ever percent or whatever in my company if you mentor me. That will entice them. Here's the truth about great people. Do you want to know the truth about great people? I'll give you the truth. As people become greater in life, and as the tree becomes taller, right, the wind becomes stronger. And when you talk, when you meet a great person, not everybody will love him or her. That's the truth. That's the absolute truth. You meet great people and you will have a percentage of the people saying, Oh, I love her, I love him, she or he is great, the most amazing person in the world. Then you will have other people saying that, Oh, he or she is horrible, terrible, da 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 Stay away from him or her. Right? Here is the thing. Trust your instinct, trust your judgment. How does that person treat you? Is that person nice to you? Does that person treat you with respect? Does that person treat you the way you should be treated? If yes, that would be the perfect mentor for you. If no, that could be a mentor for somebody else. Right? Because a mentor, there's no such thing as a perfect human being. But there can be a person who is a perfect mentor for you. As long as you're able to see that people are imperfect, imperfect people have different shades of imperfection. And you're going to read bad things about your mentors. Unfortunately, with my mentors, with my mentors, I read about them in the newspapers every day. And I read horrible things about them in the newspapers every day. 
right? There are some good things and then all of a sudden, the Panama Papers comes out. And I'm like, oh my God, my mental. <laughs> be careful, but be discerning. Right? Understand that you need mentors, right? But you have to trust your own judgment and you have to go your own way also. Next question? I hope that answered you. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Actually, I have three questions. <laughs> Don't turn me off. Uh, yeah. Uh, you suggested in your first point that we as startups um, founder would uh, should go towards aspirants instead of vitamins. Mm -hmm. And are there? And the question is, are there any? different categories of investors because I've seen more of angry birds instead of care.com. So this happens to those in the right category. And then the right. uh, second point is that you mentioned founders are more interesting if they are uh, totally in, in their startups. In the early stage, most of us need to bootstrap and then probably uh, do side jobs to support our living. How is that in, in the eyes of the investors? And I would skip the third one. Okay. Uh, I, I think because they're good questions, let me answer them and then yeah. Okay. So firstly, the question I, I have a memory of a goldfish. Uh, um, uh, vitamin versus uh, vitamin aspirin. and aspirin. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Different VC firms have different investment philosophies and different tendencies. Yeah. Now, all I am saying is that yes, somebody needs to solve the fashion problem. Okay. Somebody needs to do that. Okay. Many people are doing that. Some people, somebody needs to solve, you know, um, Angry Birds. And in fact, I have a number of games of virtual reality companies. So yeah, I, I, I get that, right? But what I'm saying right now, right, is that you are going to spend the next eight years of your life, really, like eight years, ten years, five years minimum, right? Eight years or ten years of your life working on a startup, if it even goes towards IPO or you know, to what Series A will be, whatever, right? You're going to spend the next eight or ten years of your life on this particular startup. Is it big enough? Is it big enough to justify that investment of your time? I tell you now, the greatest investment of your life is not a house, is not a car. It's yourself. It's your time. That is the greatest investment that you will ever make, right? And if you're there to solve the problem of scarves, or if you're there to solve the problem of, I don't know, a necklace or whatever, I want you to think twice. Not because I don't believe that that's important and women don't want that or whatever, but I'm asking that about you. So before you really dive in, think about, is this a big enough problem for the world to care about? And I don't want you to be solving little micro problems. I want you to be solving huge problems. Because it's the crazy problems that really change the world. And if somebody, and if you're one of those entrepreneurs where nobody gets you, nobody understands what you're doing, you could be able to win. Or you could just not be good at communicating. But either way, <laughs> right? And your next question was um, um, going in full time. Okay, yeah. right. You have to pick a cutoff deadline. You have to, right? There is never a perfect time to leave your job. Trust me. There is never a perfect time to leave security. But you just have to do it and swim and go alone. Yeah? Since when is it perfect to leave a job that pays you, third, you know, 10 million on the 30th of every month? There's never going to be a perfect time. Never. But the greatest risk in your life, well, is when you don't take a chance on yourself. That's the greatest risk, when you don't take a chance. Because you know what that, what that means? It means if you don't, number one, believe in yourself. It means you don't believe in your talent. 
It means you don't have faith that tomorrow will work itself out. It means you don't believe in your family and your support network. And it doesn't mean, and it also means that you don't believe in your own future. I'm sorry, but I understand that everybody needs money to survive, right? You've got to pay rent somehow, you've got to do this, you've got to somehow, right? But at some stage, you're going to have to make the decision of when to cut ties with employment and move on towards becoming an entrepreneur. And that's why it really is at the core of entrepreneurship. The word entrepreneurship means to undertake, doesn't it? It means to undertake. And at the core of that is really, it's all about bravery. Believing in yourself, believing in your idea, and having faith, having complete faith that the future will somehow work itself out. Okay? Cool?